So today's speaker uh, needs no introduction. So he is a true legend in the field. So I guess my time is just to let the few late people time to connect. Uh, but still, uh, so Gareth um, got his bachelor degree from Harvard and then a PhD from MIT. He then moved to uh, Denver, where he's uh, for professor since uh, quite a bit. Uh, so he's running one of the most successful uh, research lab with uh, his wife, Professor Sandra Eaton, and together they author of more than 400 research papers and book chapters, and, and many of them are very, very important papers uh, in the field. So in 2002, they uh, received the Broca Prize, and 2008 became a fellow of the International EPR ESR Society. So their uh, research program involves um, continuous wave EPR, rapid scan EPR, uh, pulse EPR applied to the study of relaxation times, spin-spin interactions, uh, metal ion in biological system, and of course, EPR imaging. And today, um, so Garrett is going to speak about uh, rapid scan EPR of nitroxide uh, to measure redox. And then you probably know that they, they pretty much invented this, this technique, which is now commercially available and uh, allows significant gain in signal to nose ratio in EPR. So Garrett, when, when you are ready, stop sharing. Thank you. Uh, my understanding and looking at that, some of the names that went by here as people have been logging on, we have a range from uh, the experts that taught me what I'm going to be talking about uh, to people who are probably wondering what is it that I'm talking about. Uh, so I think for, for both uh, ends of the extreme of, of familiarity here, uh, an overview, skipping most of the details, will be most beneficial. Uh, at first, I just want to uh, take, show two snapshots of the research group at, at different times uh, to highlight some people, some of whom are logged on here to, to listen. Uh, all the circles not around here. Anand El Jaili is at the Anshitz Medical Center and uh, she has uh, posed some problems for us that uh, are going to challenge the, the sensitivities of the methods. Uh, Josh Biller had spoken previously here. Mark Saitlin, I'll be mentioning later, has uh, now just received tenure at West Virginia University. Uh, Jalen Yu has taken his skills from here to go into computer science areas. Deborah Mitchell is a professor in our department. Joseph McPeak is now in a postdoc to uh, make some challenging applications of uh, this technique. Uh, uh, Richard Quine uh, designed most of the hardware that we're uh, dealing with on rapid scan. So on George Ryan, who makes magnets and resonators for us. Lucas is currently in the group uh, making some uh, applications of it. And uh, uh, Elin Shi is now at the National Renewable Energy Lab. Uh, Laura uh, went on to apply EPR into the MRI field and is now in a residency. And of course, uh, Sandy is the one who really should be giving this talk. So uh, try to cover the thing. Why do you do rapid scan? We give you some applications of it, show you a little bit of the hardware and software and admit to some of the practical considerations and show which way we think it's going to go. Uh, rapid scan is sort of between the slow scan uh, CW and, and the pulse time domain and has some unique applications uh, for our uses. For those who have some familiarity with CW, uh, which is uh, most of the commercial spectrometers that have been uh, sold up to this point, uh, you use mo uh, modulation usually at 100 kilohertz, lock in detection, new phase sense detection, and so on. Rapid scan, we throw all that away uh, and we just use a direct detection method, no, no modulation lock-in. Uh, and we use, uh, CW usually uses a crystal detector. Uh, we're using quadrature detection. 
And you'll see that the advantages of this will come out as we talk along here. In the normal CW way, if this is your spectrum, you modulate the field a little bit, that gives you a signal that goes up and down. And if you use about one tenth of the line width, uh, you get a moderately good derivative of this signal. What we're gonna do in rapid scan is instead of just a little modulation here, we're gonna go through the entire spectrum back and forth, uh, also at very high speed, whereas this might be sometimes between one kilohertz and 100 kilohertz on a commercial spectrometer, we'll do uh, maybe even tens of kilohertz. So we're going through the entire spectrum thousands or even tens of thousands of times per second here. Uh, on this and in subsequent slides, you'll see, and I, I think you have access to these fairly shortly after uh, the seminar, uh, there's a slide, there's a reference to a, some key paper or book chapter that we've done that will give you all the details of what I'm going through. Uh, so the result of this is that we get the absorption, and of course, because we're doing quantity detection dispersion signals, we're not getting the first derivative. Uh, our scan could be triangular, sinusoidal, it can in fact be any arbitrary shape, uh, trapezoids, uh, sink pulses, everything, anything you want in there. Uh, and what we'll see is that if you go fast enough relative to uh, the, uh, can I get rid of this? I just try. Okay. Uh, if we go fast enough relative to the uh, T2 of the <coughs> line that we're dealing with, uh, we'll get some oscillations and we'll show you we get rid of those oscillations. Uh, and you can get the slow scan signal simply by uh, deconvolving in accordance with whatever uh, scan function you used. Uh, to put that in a different plot, uh, what you normally do in a CW EPR is a modulation uh, out here at some frequency that is supposedly in a fairly quiet region. Uh, in the rapid scan, uh, we in fact can go through many times and get many harmonics of this. CW actually would be improved and it gradually the hardware is getting to the point where you really could use multiple harmonics of the CW. Uh, but uh, only very recently has commercial instrument gotten to the point that you could potentially do that. But if you can do this, now we have the advantage, a uh, whole pile of advantages are going to accumulate as we talk about this uh, right here. But now we can go through the entire spectrum many, many times and we get some additional uh, digital filtering advantages of that. Another thing in this is that, in fact, we're on, on signal very short time because we're going through it so, so rapidly. Uh, and you can put more uh, power, or square root of power is B1. Uh, here, if we had a nitroxide in the normal sort of power saturation curve, you would go through some maximum and it saturates down. You need to be in this linear region down here to get decent results. Uh, but in fact, if we're going fast enough, in this case, 1.8 megagauss per second through that, we can have the same degree of uh, distortion from linearity up, up here, about uh, five times as much in the signal intensity, uh, simply because we're going through it uh, faster. So here's some examples of the kind of things uh, that we do, and we'll revisit these in different ways as we go along. Uh, in each case, uh, the I, sh I shouldn't have to tell you, the, the good spectrum is rapid scan and the bad spectrum is a CW spectrum. Uh, this is just a nitrogen encapsulated in C60. Uh, all, in all cases, I'm showing you the CW and the rapid scan were acquired in the same time, total time, whether it be 10 seconds or two minutes or whatever. Uh, so you see that uh, certainly you can see the peaks in here and that would be a, enough to, uh, to prove and in the early days enough to publish, uh, but now in rapid scan you get uh, so much better signal. Uh, this was a sample that was brought to us by the group that Joseph McPeak is in right now, uh, and uh, hydrogenated morphous silicon. Uh, very difficult to get good quantitative results out of the CW spectrum. In the rapid scan, we gave a signal noise improvement in the same unit time with a factor of 250. Uh, here's a, a nitrogen center and diamond. Uh, it's in fact difficult to see it in the CW spectrum and the time scale that we used here. 
uh, but uh, very nice in the rapid scan species. Uh, uh, Deborah Mitchell uh, was doing some spin trapping here. And uh, yes, if, if you love your experiment, you can see that there was a spectrum uh, here and they succeeded in trapping uh, the superoxide uh, with this trapping agent. Uh, but in the rapid scan spectrum, it's very, very strong. So we got signal noise improvements at the same time, uh, 17 or so for the nitro oxide, 25 for the nitrogen C60, 140 for the defect in diamond, 250 for the nitrogen morphous silica. In fact, in some cases, the signal noise is so good, you can't really measure it accurately with an 8-bit digitizer. So you could argue though, that we're doing the absorption and you get so much more inspiration out of the derivative. Well, if you're fitting, uh, simulating the spectrum, you can get, if you get the same signal noise, the line shape can be simulated with the same accuracy for absorption and derivative uh, in any area of spectroscopy. Sometimes you get advantages of taking derivatives. And in fact, we're showing your derivatives in most of the spectra I'm showing here today. Uh, even if you do, uh, electronic uh, absorption spectra, standard UV, uh, visible, uh, it's often be beneficial to take derivatives of the spectrum. Uh, but in fact, if you're trying to get areas, uh, a double integration of a derivative spectrum has enormous baseline problems. So getting the absorption instead of the derivatives is a benefit for that. And of course, if you uh, have some broad signals in the presence of sharp signals, uh, you'll see that better in the absorption spectrum than you will in the derivative because the broad spectra uh, can, can almost look like a flat baseline in a, a derivative spectrum. So our advantages are that the scan rates can be chosen to fit the kinetics of the spin system, whether that's kinetics or relaxation times or population changes. Uh, it's uh, very many uh, long relaxation time species run by CW actually have passage effects that are distorting the spectrum. They're very rarely recognized by the people who do the spectroscopy, but they're there uh, in the rapid scan spectrum uh, that's taken care of. Uh, and of course, there's a, a gap between good CW and good pulse uh, with regard to relaxation times and the rapid scan is filling in some of that. Uh, so you can pick the scan rate to choose the kinetics, whether it's relaxation times or population changes and so on. Uh, the passage effect uh, distortions can be minimized. The signal noise, as I've just shown you, is much higher uh, for the same data acquisition time than it is in CW. Uh, one of the big problems that people have recognized from day one in CW is that um, modulation broadens the lines. Uh, you know, standard C, uh, 100 kilohertz modulation puts sidebands on, usually buried within the line width, but if you have really narrow lines like in the uh, tridal radicals and so on, uh, you need to go to very small, low mod modulation frequencies to avoid line shape distortions. Uh, if we get oscillations, uh, you can exploit them in certain circumstances. You can always remove them by deconvolution. Uh, and be because of the fact that we don't have to integrate twice, we can get better spin count with a rapid scan than we can with CW, get high temporal resolution. We don't need to use high powers uh, that you would have to for, uh, for your transfer from EPR. Uh, and uh, we don't have to worry about the T2 decay time that would, that would dominate uh, in an FID. So lots of advantages there. Now, how do we, what kind of things do we apply it to? Well, well literally, uh, if you can think of some problem that was, that's difficult to do by CW or rapid scan that we don't mention here today, uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, some of the examples I've just given you are, uh, are problems that people brought to us uh, just to see whether rapid scan would help. And now we're in the mode of bring us a problem that, that we can't solve because that will cause us to make a better system. Uh, Maybe sell a system. <laughs> Lots of people have their microphones on. I hope you can. So let's take a couple examples that, that help define what we're seeing here. Just the lithium thalocyanine, for example, or its derivatives. And the next seminar in the series is going to be about some of these kinds of derivatives. Uh, 
here's if we just integrate the regular CW uh, derivative signal here, uh, this would and done with five kilohertz modulation frequency because it's so narrow. Uh, here's the line if we use the rapid scan method, uh, first starting out at about a thousand guys per second, it looks almost the same as the slow scan. But as you go faster and faster, you get these uh, oscillations uh, after it. It's not just like an FID because you see the spacing between these is changing because your distance away from the line is changing uh, as you scan. Uh, this is the kind of oscillation uh, that for those of you who are old enough to remember there was even a time when NMR uh, was a continuous wave technique. This is what we used to shim the NMR spectrometer uh, to, uh, to maximize these oscillations to show that we had a homogeneous field. So here's another sample for you. Uh, same kind of plot as I showed you for the uh, nitroxa a few minutes ago, uh, but this is the irradiated quartz sample. Uh, and you see the, the rates which were, if you had a slow scan spectrum here, the irradiated quartz signal would go through a maximum almost off the chart here and, and just about go away by the time we applied any power to it. Uh, but if we go very rapidly, you see here at 4.7 megagauss per second through it, uh, we're still almost linear region uh, way up to this power. Uh, and as you would see as you go through that, that you see the oscillations uh, due to the uh, short, uh, the long T2 here. If you uh, deconvolve that, you get the integral spectrum. If you want to see that like a derivative spectrum, we can take the derivative here and then compare that with a CW. Uh, the CW spectrum is actually very difficult to do. And in fact, those of you uh, who are uh, te teaching students or are dealing with, with people who consider themselves hot shots at EPR, give them an irradiated quartz sample and see if they can actually get a, a decent CW spectrum from it. It's a very difficult task and it challenges uh, your spectrometer as well as to how well it's uh, locked to the center frequency and so on. So let's take a more familiar sample for you. Uh, these are nitroxides, uh, immobilized though at room temperature. In this case, it's just uh, fruited tempone and sucrose octaacetate, which is a, a decent room temperature glass. Again, we could have gotten a better spectrum, of course, by going slow, more slowly, but uh, uh, the rapid scan was giving such good signal to noise, it almost, almost impossible to distinguish uh, the noise in the spectrum. And so at the same time, you got a 52 for the CW and 700 for the rapid scan. And if you take the derivative of the rapid scan, of course, then you highlight the, the noise a bit better. And so the signal noise drops a bit. This was T4 lysozyme, doubly labeled with a spirocyclohexyl that uh, Dr. Reitze uh, and uh, some others worked on, sent to our lab. This is in triolose uh, glass at room temperature. And again, we got a very good rapid scan uh, signal to noise for those nitroxides. Uh, those were all X-band. Uh, let's go down low in frequency. Here's an L-band spectrum, uh, rated malonic acid. Usually in malonic acid spectra that you see are, are nearly perfect X-band spectra, uh, Peter Hofer's favorite molecule. Uh, but we chose a small sample and we chose to do it at, uh, at L-band. Uh, and I got terrible CW spectrum, but in the same time, signal noise went from 13 to 300 when we used the rapid scan. Uh, showing uh, that no matter how many papers you've uh, published, people have, uh, have either ignored them or, uh, or forgotten them. People challenged us a little while ago uh, well, that's all fine on signal noise, but you can't see highly resolved spectra. Uh, so Joseph McPeak took that as a good challenge, and, and so did Peter Huffer, uh, Sylvia Patrick, uh, and Ralph and Bruker. Uh, they contributed the, uh, the perylene uh, spectrum, uh, and uh, uh, jo Joseph made the D DPNO. In each case here, the I shouldn't have to tell you at this point that the bad looking blue spectrum is the CW spectrum and the good, spe good red spectrum is the, CW, is the uh, rapid scan spectrum. But you can see you know, the CTPO spectrum, uh, you get very good resolution of, of all the protons here, DPNO the same way. 
Uh, you can hardly distinguish some of these in the, in the CW spectrum taken at the same time, and they're well-defined in the rapid scan spectrum. Uh, you notice this galvanoxyl uh, spectrum, we're only looking at one gauss of the, of the width of that spectrum to get all of that uh, resolution there. So uh, for the, these, these particular spectra were chosen because they're often the example people use uh, as a, a challenge of hyperfine splittings in CW spectra. And uh, so we chose this uh, set of four of them as, to demonstrate that uh, rapid scan could do as well or better than CW, even on question of hyperfine. Well, what about imaging? Since uh, this OTM series is uh, often focusing some on imaging, uh, the signal noise uh, in, uh, improvement is of uh, course a great advantage in decreasing acquisition time. Uh, and because we get the absorption signal directly, uh, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to suffer the same problem at high gradients because the, the, signal, the uh, amplitude of the present the gradient is approximately linear for the absorption signal, but falling approximately quadratically for the first derivative signal. Uh, so the fact that we're getting absorption is an overall benefit there for the imaging. Well, let's look at uh, Josh Biller uh, did uh, this challenge. Uh, this is now down to 250 megahertz uh, with a uh, phantom made up of uh, three different uh, nitroxide solutions of half millimolar. A CW uh, spectral spatial image done in five minutes. Clearly, you can see that the uh, you can see the meta hydrogen CTPO. Uh, splitting here, uh, but it's, uh, you would hope it could be a little better rapid scan at the same time. Uh, five minutes gave us very clean spectrum. So then we asked how fast could we do the rapid scan and get something that's approximately the same as the five minute CW. And it turned out to be about a half a minute to do that. So now let's uh, look at this spectrum and then I'm gonna on the next slide to try to explain how we did this because uh, those of you who've done a little bit of imaging uh, should immediately re react. Uh, this is an impossible image to have obtained. Uh, um, well, at, are you talking about this stuff? At 250 megahertz, the center field is 90 Gauss roughly. Uh, and we're doing 40 Gauss scans, uh, 40 Gauss range of image. But if you're doing the, the usual kind of uh, image acquisition and reconstruction, you'd have to have a large gradients and have to have very, very large scan widths, uh, impossibly large scan widths to get uh, this kind of spatial resolution. If we, uh, the other feature on this slide to emphasize to you is we then take a, uh, a slice through uh, this image and we uh, overlay that with the non-gradient spectrum. And if you can't distinguish between them, uh, that's a good thing because it shows that uh, the, the uh, image reconstruction is, is basically giving us a, a perfect match of the non-gradient spectrum. So how did we do that? Uh, what, what's the possibility there? Uh, if you use the standard filter back projection, uh, the method that uh, we used in our first imaging of EPR, I guess literally 40 years ago uh, this time, I guess it is, uh, the, the projections have to be equally spaced uh, in the spectral spatial plane. The sweep was increased with increasing gradient. Uh, that's relatively easy to do uh, at X band where you're, you're talking about uh, scans that are maybe a percent of the, of the center field, but at, uh, at low frequency that that's, uh, really can't be done. And while we were, fortunately, Mark Zaitlin was in the lab uh, with us at the time that everybody was sitting around woe is me, this is impossible. How do we get ourselves into this? And I was waving my hands and muttering about the way I viewed uh, uh, the image and acquisition and reconstruction. And Mark said, oh, that's easy math. And he rushed off and did it. And so now we do projections at arbitrarily spaced angles. Uh, required uh, sweep widths now are smaller than those for filtered back projection. You do the, uh, the reconstruction in ways that look like it's all, we don't do parallel processing yet, but it, it all it should be compatible with that. So th that kind of uh, approach allowed us to make an image like the one I just showed you, which otherwise was impossible. And then uh, we go on now from 250, let's do one at 700 megahertz. 
this glass apparatus is sort of an artificial mouse here uh, with uh, in sample uh, three is uh, OX63. Uh, sample one is an N14 nitroxide and sample two is an N15 nitroxide. Here's the spectral space, here's the, uh, the nine gradient spectrum. Uh, and uh, now here's the spectral spatial image and you can see all of those coming out very clearly. So we want to really apply this now to biomedical problems and uh, Joe Cao, who's uh, uh, in the, the group that's uh, attending here today, uh, made this compound where the, a sulfur-sulfur bond between two nitroxides or N15 nitroxide, so you get a two-line spectrum. And because there's some flexibility here, these these nitroxides are colliding with one another enough to get this exchange line uh, between the two outer lines uh, for version one. If this now reacts uh, in vivo with a reducing agent, uh, then it cleaves that sulfur-sulfur bond and you should get just a simple uh, N15 nitroxide double, double line spectrum. And that's what you, you see here, still a little bit of, the, uh, of compound two at equilibrium here. And this is uh, an image of this that was done uh, by uh, uh, Howard Halpern's uh, lab, including our hosts for this uh, talk today. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can see that the uh, most highly re reducing, that is the, the fastest rate for this reaction is occurring within the tumor region. And that, that's a general kind of phenomenon. And, uh, Joe Kao is going on now to take this from a kinetics experiment to an equilibrium experiment by keeping these things close together and, and don't allow them to diffuse apart. So let's talk a little bit about some of the hardware and, uh, and software uh, that's involved in this. Uh, just as a transition here, this is uh, one of our uh, X-band spectrometers uh, with uh, some of the home-built, the, literally the black boxes are all home-built boxes. Uh, and you can see here we're using, uh, in addition to a, a Bruker uh, magnet and so on, there's a, a Bruker resonator. We're going to see this up close in just a minute, so we'll skip on from that. Uh, a key thing here is resonators. You, you need good penetration of these rapidly changing magnetic fields. And so uh, a standard uh, good brass box resonator is so the, the worst possible case. Uh, so you have to, for example, if you want to minimize eddy currents, you not only use wire, but you use a very small diameter wire. Uh, you have to build the system mechanically to minimize mechanical vibrations of the system. And even then, uh, you know, there's always going to be a vibration. There has to be for any mechanical device. And so you have to search around. Sometimes you find uh, 2 kilohertz is terrible, but 2.03 kilohertz is wonderful. And so you, you have to search for the good, good scan frequency. Uh, at X-Band, we always use Bruker dielectric resonators because that's the closest we can come to minimizing metal around the sample. Uh, if you're doing low frequency, you'd like, actually like to use the cross-loop resonators of the sort that George Reinhardt built. And now you want good isolation between the source and the detector, and that, that helps, uh, the, the cross-loop resonator helps do that. And there's all sorts of ways you can design those. Uh, so the scan coils, we're going to scan the magnetic field. Here's, here's a close-up of the uh, gap region of a, a Bruker iron core magnet. Uh, we then have these two coils uh, that are going to give us, we establish the main field with this the big magnet, and then we do all the rapid scan here uh, with these coils. Uh, just a little, little bit more of a close-up here as they're around the Bruker flex line system. Uh, to make good coils here, you want to use this so-called Litz wire. Uh, this, uh, although it looks like a, a standard, uh, uh, very small wire, it's actually 255 strands of AWG44 wire. With that a particular combination, we could get scans of 37.7 Gauss per amp of current applied, uh, 155 Gauss wide scans up to 13.4 kilohertz. Uh, those who are electrical engineers uh, are at least a little bit familiar with it will recognize that your limitations here turn out to be voltages. Uh, it, and you have to be careful because you can generate thousands of volts. And in fact, uh, we have uh, 
had trouble sometimes getting capacitors that we didn't burn out simply by giving them too high a voltage across them from trying to push the scan a little higher. We've made another one that was a 200 Gauss scan. That's the farthest we've dared push anything uh, on these kinds of coils. Uh, but that's that's the general approach toward getting a rapid scan. Uh, of course, you have to drive that properly, and uh, most power supplies will not drive an inductive load very well. Uh, so there was a lot of engineering development in that. This is just a photograph of the inside of one of the coil drivers that uh, Richard Klein built. We have both linear drivers. Uh, actually, they have an input for an arbitrary uh, shape, uh, and uh, we we also resonate them. Uh, we get very large fields. We can resonate it, and so capacity. In the Bruker system, this is all hidden from the user, and uh, you, you simply type in a, a software command to change the frequencies. Uh, we use our fingers instead, uh, not on the keyboard, but by changing capacitors. And uh, the whole thing is very simply circuit. You've got a, a driver and inductance capacitance, and therefore you resonate at a particular frequency and uh, you can get to maximum of these, uh, scan rates. Well, uh, we're now trying to, to make a system, not just do it at one gigahertz, but do it as a benchtop system at one gigahertz, hoping that uh, once this is all small enough and, and compartmentalized enough to be on a benchtop, uh, everybody interested in preclinical imaging and so on will be able to do this. Uh, and this is a picture of it as it sits in our lab today. Uh, this magnet, uh, uh, it generates some, a field adequate for uh, one, uh, one gigahertz uh, imaging. Uh, and it's small enough that any of the people who are uh, listening to this talk today could pick it up and move it around. And just as a close up here of the resonator inside the magnet, you see, uh, it is the right, it's a one inch diameter there, so you can, you can put a mouse uh, in it, even a mouse that wasn't generated by a 3D printer. But let's talk about the resonators a bit more. The key thing on uh, doing a rapid scan uh, properly here is to have a resonator and be matching the bandwidths of your, uh, of your signal uh, and your resonator. In a CW, you usually use the highest Q you can consistent with the source noise. So CW resonators are usually at least uh, a Q of 3000 or so. The dielectric resonators go up to 10,000. Uh, and you have to have a very good source to be able to exploit that. Pulse and rapid scan, you use a low Q uh, to get the response times you want. Uh, and you do also, of course, have to worry about the bandwidth of your detection system. Uh, but it's the frequency components of the signal you're dealing with that determine what you have to, to do here. Uh, so let's talk about uh, what happens when you drive the magnetic field rapidly through the signal. There's something what we call the, the driving function, uh, which is uh, the scan rate and frequency units here in the exponent, uh, what you to get rid of, when you deconvolve these, you divide by the Fourier transform of the signal by the Fourier transform of this driving function. And then you get the absorption signal back by inverse Fourier transform. Uh, uh, that's about, a, I'm going to use this uh, term A here in just a, a moment. So I want you to let you know what it is. It's, it's, uh, it's a function that's determined by how fast you're scanning through in fre frequency units. Uh, because we scan in one in either upfield or downfield, you're actually using only half of the resonator bandwidth uh, for the rapid scan. Uh, so your normal uh, bandwidth formula you have a factor of two in there. Uh, and if you've got a sinusoidal scan and relate it to the spin relaxation time, uh, uh, T2, and it's really a T2 star that matters to you. It's how, how, what the frequency components are in the experimental spectrum. Uh, so we define that bandwidth. Uh, there's, a there's a factor in here, which is uh, a variable that you use to define how accurately you want to have, have things. Uh, we usually use an end of five. Basically, since this came from that exponential function, 
that it says five time constants, so you're you know, way down there in the uh, almost a complete recovery, but not perfect. And then some of the very high resolution spectra I showed you, we had to use uh, ends uh, greater than, than five. Uh, but if you just want to see a signal uh, as, fast, as fast as you can, and you don't care about a little bit of line width distortion, uh, you could uh, use a, a higher Q, which would give you, uh, to some extent, better sensitivity, uh, but except that you're going to distort it a bit. But in general, your con key concept is you want your signal bandwidth uh, less than the resonator bandwidth to avoid the broadening. Uh, so uh, in general, uh, with pulse EPR, with a few exceptions of so, uh, Triddle, LAPC, and a couple of the very narrow line spectra, your bandwidths don't encompass the full spectrum. And you certainly can't with a nitroxide radical except sort of as a, a show and tell uh, with a narrow line system and, uh, and a Bruker x system. Uh, the noise of the detection path is going to be lower for CW because you can use uh, a narrower bandwidth, but after deconvolution, your signal is the same for rapid scan as it is for CW uh, or for a, a pulse that's been transformed. And so then you can optimize your signal noise with post-processing. So the question, how long are we on? I mentioned before that because we were in the signal for a short time, we could use a lot more power. Well, let's just take a, an arbitrary case of a nitroxide with 130 milligauss wide line. And if we scanned at only two kilohertz scan frequency and an 80 gauss width, uh, that's, so that's uh, a two megagauss per second, you're on resonance of, of this 130 milligauss for only 260 nanoseconds. Well, it's very common for us to use 260 nanosecond pulses in pulse DPR. Uh, so we're, we're exciting the spins uh, for times that are similar to that of uh, a pulse experiment. And this is part of what gives us this much larger, another way of looking at what gives us this larger signal for uh, rapid scan than for CW. So how far as can you go? I worked with uh, Ralph Weber. Uh, we uh, had the idea that uh, actually, we've been teaching everybody for so long that you have an electric field and a magnetic field and uh, electromagnetic radiation. I said, yeah, if that's real, uh, then you have any Zender coils doing you know, a, few, a few hundred megahertz or something. How about just rotating them, use the, uh, the B field of the Endor coils to scan the magnetic field? And we did that uh, with this, and uh, it was 1.24 gigagauss per second. And now, uh, Peter Neugerbauer is using the same kind of concept, but sweeping the frequency, which you can now do faster as you scan a field. Uh, and so he's up to 9.5 gigagauss per second, maybe longer, maybe faster than that by this time, but that's the last number I remember giving me. But you, so the, the limit is only an engineering limit. Uh, how fast can you go? Another question that would come up is, but can any of this stuff be quantitative? Uh, hopefully most people are, uh, but with some who are attending are not familiar with it. You can, in uh, CW APR, uh, make a very quantitative. You actually can go from, uh, as, as always is true, the analytical balance would tell you how many spins, you know, the period of your sample, how many spins you have, knowing your Q and, uh, uh, and all the features of your system, you can actually calculate from the number of spins in your system exactly how many volts of signal you should record on your digitizer. Uh, and if we then compared this at 250 megahertz, 1.5 gigahertz, 9.1 gigahertz, each of these factors of six, uh, we shouldn't have gotten a, a 1.57 difference between each of them. And we got 1.52, 1.4, 1.14. Uh, this has been described as the hardest problem uh, in EPR. And I think we've we're embarrassingly uh, accurate on that. So how can we, how can we actually get something that's, that's that accurate? Well, uh, in fact, uh, we we worrying about that because we had some confidence in our results. Uh, one set of people did the experimental measurements, and uh, another did the computations and compared the results at the end. Uh, so there was no bias put into either of those. 
So we did the same thing you know, with, uh, with pulse. We can calculate exactly what we should see in a pulse experiment and calculate exactly what we should see in a rapid scan. And for this particular sample setup we had, uh, we predicted 1.92 and we got 2.07. So yes, the rapid scan is as quantitative as CW and pulse are. So with that, then which, which of these applications should you use for a particular sample? Uh, although we can do oximetry with trials and LAPC and so on with rapid scan, uh, I think the, the work that, uh, uh, that uh, Howard, uh, Howard's lab has done and, and we were joint with them on developing this uh, years ago, uh, I think oximetry uh, with these narrow line symbols is still best pulse with, done with pulse DPR. Uh, and uh, for, for many applications, in fact, you, the great advantage of pulse over CW and rapid scan, even in NMR, uh, is the ability to set initial uh, conditions. Uh, if you're just going for signal noise per unit time, uh, and we've shown that with, uh, for example, LIPC, the, the limitations of an X-band pulse spectrometer in terms of repetition rate say that you can't get as good signals out of pulse as you can out of, uh, out of, CW, out of rapid scan. Uh, but that's simply because of the, the limitations of the duty cycle of the TWT. Uh, if you're looking at physiology or any materials uh, that use nitroxides or other wide line aspect of that, it's going to be better with rapid scan than with pulse or CW. And of course, if you're looking at transient radicals, uh, you do use rapid scan. Now, uh, the first commercial instrument to apply this is now available from Bruker. Uh, you can go use your lunch money and buy one of these from them today. Uh, there's a, an adaption uh, for, to the X-band bridge. Uh, and it fits in a standard magnet that you presumably already have, uses a new scan driver and a fast digitizer and, and so on. Uh, so all of that is, is quite feasible. Oh, I should also point out that with this system and demonstrating the kinetics, uh, they have dropped a piece of uh, uh, BDPA uh, through the resonator and got spectra fast enough that you can just uh, measure uh, gravitational force, I guess. And, and so on. Uh, if you don't believe that gravity works, you, you can actually measure the, how, how long it takes uh, for that to to go through the, the resonator and get uh, a dozen or so spectra along the way. So what about the future? Uh, there have been all these, uh, sure, CW is a gold standard. We wrote, wrote the book on how to do it right. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, modulation has been undesirable necessity. The, uh, there's passage effects and so on. You can replace CW with improved signal noise for all samples that anybody's brought us so far. Uh, and I think it was uh, Josh who is attending here today that said, well, the right answer to this question is, uh, we showed on some of our broad uh, low temperature manganese spectra, uh, that if you, you always have some baseline problems in CW and many people just use some polynomial fit to subtract those off. Uh, but in fact, uh, when we did that in CW, it took out all of the broad spectra. But when we did a rapid scan experiment, uh, one, one of those actually contributions was real. Uh, and so uh, Josh's joke was, uh, if you don't want to see the embarrassing signals that you can't explain, use CW, otherwise use rapid scan. Uh, 